Welcome to Channel's Business Globe with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Coming up on today's show, international governments have signed a world-first agreement on artificial intelligence at the Global AI Safety Summit, which took place at Bletchley Park in Oxford this weekend. Wilson Tijani, Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Communications, Innovation and the Digital Economy, spoke with me exclusively on the sidelines, and I'll be bringing you that discussion shortly. And Britain's King Charles and Queen Camilla have been on a state visit to Kenya this week, where under much scrutiny, the head of the Commonwealth acknowledged the abhorrent and unjustifiable acts of violence committed against Kenyans during their independent struggles. Agnes Gittow, the Executive Director at the Eastern Africa Association, responsible for the UK and Europe will be joining me from London for her assessment on the trip. Then later, this week's evidence given to Britain's COVID-19 inquiry has brought uncomfortable reminders of the chaos in Boris Johnson's government during, during the pandemic. Our business correspondent Simon Pusey will soon be joining me here in the studio for an update. But first... Hundreds of world leaders, tech bosses, academics and AI researchers gathered at the UK's Bletchley Park campus for the first Artificial Intelligence Safety Summit, seeking to address misuse and loss of control of the technology. The historic signing of the Bletchley Declaration means China has agreed to work with the United States, the European Union and other countries to collectively manage the AI risk. We're going to start with some questions and then we're going to open it up. The, the, the two... Um Currently, the two leading centers for AI development are the San Francisco Bay Area and the, and the sort of London area. The, um, and there, there are many other places where it's being done, but those are the two leading areas. So I think if, um, you know, if, if, the, if the United States and the UK um, and, and China are um, sort of aligned on, on safety, that's all going to be a, a good thing. Because that's really, that's where, that's, that's where the, the leadership is generally. Actually, it's interesting, you mentioned China there. So I, yeah. I took a decision to invite China to the summit over the last Very few good. days. And it was not an easy decision. A lot of people criticized me for it. Uh, you know, my view is if you're going to try... It's essential. When I, was, when I was in China earlier this year, the, my main subject of discussion with this, this, the leadership in China was AI safety and saying that this, this is really something that they, they should care about. And um, they took it seriously, and, and, I'm, and, um, and you are too, which is, which is great. Um, and having them here, I think, was essential, really. If they're, if they're, if they're not participants, it's, it's uh, pointless. Like when you look at the, the landscape of things that you see as possible, what is it that you, know, you are yeah, particularly... I, but if you have a humanoid robot, it can, it can basically chase you anywhere. So I, I think we should have some kind of um, hardwired local cutoff um, that, you, <coughs> that you can't update from the Internet. <laughs> so anything that can be software updated from the Internet obviously can be overridden. Um, but if you have a local sort of off switch um, where you perhaps say a keyword or something and then that puts the robot into a safe state, um, some kind of localized safe state ability, um, an off switch, you know, uh, where you don't have to get too close to the robot. I, I don't know. So we, 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 if we've got millions of these things going all over the place. We, you're, you're not selling it. Just, you know, like that. <laughs> no, I, I, I know. Um, <laughs> I, I'm saying this is something we should be quite concerned about, because um, if the robot can, fo robot can follow you anywhere, then you know, what if they just one day get a software update and they're not so friendly anymore? Um, then we've got a James Cameron movie on our hands. Just as AI has the potential to do profound good, it also has the potential to cause profound harm. From AI-enabled cyber attacks at a scale beyond anything we've seen before, to AI-formulated bioweapons that could endanger the lives of millions of people. These threats are often referred to as the existential threats of AI, because, of course, they could endanger the very existence of humanity. These threats, without question, are profound and they demand global action. I firmly believe that we must be guided by a common set of understandings among nations. And that is why the United States will continue to work with our allies and partners to apply existing international rules and norms to AI and work to create 
new rules and norms. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Communications, Innovation and the Digital Economy, Bosun Tijani, who is in England for the historic gathering. Honourable Minister Bosun Tijani, thank you so much for joining me. Very short notice on Channels Business Global. Of course, you are amongst um, a pretty high list of world leaders, AI experts, um, the likes of Elon Musk at Bletchley Park in Oxford for the world's first artificial intelligence safety summit. Can you talk to us about some of the major uh, talking points and how this is going to shape the next four years of your uh, portfolio? Uh, thanks, thanks, Gillian. I think uh, this is not just going to shape my portfolio, but I think the future of, of, of Nigeria is significant. I, I think we're extremely uh, fortunate uh, you know, to, to be privileged to be part of this uh, conversation at this level. Uh, and I think I want to call out the fact that this is a testimony uh, to how the body language of the current government is inspiring uh, the world to understand that Nigeria is open for business and not just open for business, that we are also keen uh, to provide leadership, regional leadership, to issues that are important to humanity. Uh, many people hear about artificial intelligence, but, but only a few actually understand uh, how significant this is uh, for humanity. Uh, to, to put it into, into context, this is almost at the level of atomic bomb. The imagine uh, generation is part of the generation that has discovered atomic bomb, and we're trying to make sense out of it in terms of the power to be able to create value for society, but also the danger that comes with it as well. That's the best way I can describe it to anybody. Imagine this is just the discovery of atomic bomb. That's what we have in artificial intelligence. It's a technological tool that, that offers humanity a unique way of solving problems, a unique way of being able to understand how to address poverty, you know, how to uh, deal with education challenges uh, in, in a scalable manner. You know, how to ensure that countries like Nigeria, with all our resources and uh, competitive edge in agriculture, that we can actually do agriculture effectively uh, to, to create value for the nation. So we are here um, coming together to decide the future of this technology, which has significant impact, but also a significant impact in terms of misuse and ensuring that as we're building and developing this technology, that we're doing so with safety in mind so that we can protect society and ensure that people don't have abuses as well. Thank you very much for that thorough assessment of um, the pretty extraordinary um, two days. And you're absolutely right. I listened to the opening address, virtual albeit because he's in uh, Kenya, of King Charles III. And he said exactly what you're saying, that, you know, the evolution of artificial intelligence can be compared to the splitting of the atom, can be compared to harnessing of fire and the creation of the will. Uh, do you think those of us who are not as savvy on the internet understand <laughs> understand um, just how much of an existential threat artificial intelligence can be, but also how amazing it can be in terms of leapfrogging some of the issues we're having in health and education. And are you thinking about ways that you can use some of the discussions you've had in Bletchley Park uh, to take back to Abuja and obviously impact the lives of Nigerians in a wonderful no, way? No. I absolutely, not just take back to Abuja. I think one thing we've done since uh, coming into office is, is making it clear that we do have an understanding of why this is an important phenomenon for the world, but also for Nigeria. And uh, we've made a strong case, our body language and the statements we've put out there, the strategic blueprint for the ministry is very clear that we understand this technology, we understand why Nigeria must position that we shouldn't focus on the wicked problem of poverty and the likes, then ignore what's going to change our world. What's already changing our world? You know, this is a tool that can actually help us address poverty issues or some of the challenges that we're facing. So we're very strong uh, about that. And that's why we're here. The reason why, you know, we're one of the three, only three African countries that is here is because there's clarity in how we're going to approach this moving forward. And we're the, remember, Nigeria was the only country that actually made opening remark yesterday as well. Yeah. So, you know, alongside countries like the US, Canada, uh, South Korea, but also India and UAE as well. So that's a big statement. So we do have that understanding in government and we're going to put resources into it. So your first comment, I, I think 
what we need to do as government is to provide leadership uh, for how, as a nation, we uh, generate values from this technology for the benefit of our people and the development of our nation. But whilst doing that, we also then need to ensure that we're protecting society from the vices of the technology. We do not need uh, to bother the ordinary people about the danger and things like that. If we provide the right leadership for it, we can protect society and ensure that the laws are there, that businesses and countries are building uh, more consciously and intentionally with safety at heart. That's the role of the government. What we want the ordinary person on the streets to do is to understand that, that there's a power in this new technology and we should actually use it uh, for economic development, for empowering self. It can help you to learn faster. It can help you to access knowledge that typically wasn't available to the ordinary person. It can help you to access and process information much more faster than the human brain can actually uh, do. That's what we want the everyday person, the businesses in Nigeria to understand, so that they start to position for the application of AI for, for prosperity. Because if we don't do that, we're going to be left behind. And this is not a technology that is right for use in four years' time or in six years' time or in 10 years. It's today. Yeah. Generative AI is already around us. But there are so many other ways in which you can use AI as well, whether you're a small business, a large business. So I think Nigerian companies should actually start to invest in the application of AI it, for raising productivity, for becoming more competitive, because this is the world we are living today. You're absolutely right. Wonderful contributions from you over the past couple of days. The only thing left for you to do, of course, is to make sure before you leave England yeah. that uh, you speak with Elon Musk and get him to Abuja. We can't <laughs> wait for that. Um, it's very difficult to get a minister as busy as you. So before I let you go, I do want to bring the discussion a bit broader, if I may. You go across the world, from what I can see, um, you know, everybody wants to talk to the Nigerian delegation. You can barely sit down for five minutes to grab a coffee. But on the other hand, there are some individuals and some people that do believe brand Nigeria is in a crisis at the moment. Uh, what is your opinion of that? How has your experience been in New York, here in the UK? No, I think what I, you know, when, when I'm asked this question, what, what I remind people is where the world has been in the last three, four years. And I don't think we're doing justice to, to that reality. We all came out of COVID about three uh, just two years ago, or, or even a year ago, and nations were struggling with being able to quickly get things together, get economies moving again. Uh, the disruption that COVID has caused all over the world is also affecting us in our nation as well. We shouldn't forget that. You know, people don't just leave Nigeria, for instance, the medical doctors that are leaving out the technology talent just because Nigeria is totally terrible. That's not that's not why people are leaving. It's because it's because globally there's urgent need for workforce. And these dynamics are responsible for why we're also losing losing talent as well. So the rhetorics around Nigeria, you know, being in trouble, actually don't buy it. I think Nigeria is just coming out of these difficult times, like many other countries in the world. But on top of that as well is the need for us to diversify our economy. And I think for those who are paying attention to what our president has been saying, it's putting everything into not, not just rebuilding the Nigerian economy and making it business as usual. It's actually working hard and getting his ministers to think diversification. How can we use technology to really raise the level of competitiveness up? Across our key sectors, is challenging the Ministry of Education to reimagine education, challenging trade and investment, not only to find capital to invest in Nigeria, but find productive capital to help reimagine the Nigerian economy. It's challenging my ministry to ensure that we can use technology to, to raise the level of productivity in the public sector, understanding that the public sector is productive. The rest of the economy is also going to tap into that energy, but also the productivity that is coming from there. Honourable Minister Bosun yeah. Tijani, uh, the Honourable <laughs> Minister of Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy. What a pleasure it's been speaking with you today on Channels Business Global at Bletchley Park in Oxford, of course, for the government's first Artificial Intelligence Safety Summit. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank, Thank you. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.
This week's evidence given to Britain's COVID-19 inquiry has brought uncomfortable reminders of the chaos in Boris Johnson's government during the pandemic. According to senior figures who have been delivering their testimonies over the past few days, there was never a day when COVID-19 rules were fully followed in number 10. The probe has been set up to examine the UK's response to and impact of the coronavirus pandemic and learn lessons for the future. Well, for more on this, I was earlier joined in the studio by our business correspondent Correspondent Simon Pusey. Simon, for obvious reasons, the war in the Middle East is very distracting at the moment. However, there are domestic issues. Of course, we've got the AI summit in Bletchley Park. But then another big domestic story, um, quite horrifying for some, is the ongoing COVID-19 inquiry. It's been going on for quite some time. Uh, but this week, um, we had some major players from that period um, given their testimonies. Talk to us about what's been revealed or rehashed. Yeah, and it's worth revisiting, isn't it? Because uh, over these, this period of a couple of years, this is all we were focused on. Um, and so we knew this inquiry was coming and now it's happened. Um, the purpose of the inquiry is to learn lessons um, on a matter of public concern. No one's going to be found innocent or guilty. Right. Um, that doesn't rule out, obviously, criminal proceedings, but it's oh. not about that at the moment. Mm. It's more trying to Fact work finding. out what happened exactly. So um, if and when this happens again, we're in a better position, I think, is the idea behind this. Um, but we're sort of unraveling um, you know what happened, what the government were doing, the reasons they were taking the decisions they were, um, using things like emails and WhatsApps to sort of get to the bottom of what was happening. Um, and this is all quite embarrassing for the people at the time who were in government That's because true. when they were sending a lot of these WhatsApps, they weren't thinking that these might be, maybe naively, they weren't thinking this is going to be public discourse um, in a couple of years' time. So we're hearing that, um, uh, you know, Boris Johnson, a lot about Boris Johnson, obviously, who was Prime Minister at the time, and his close aides, so Lee Kane and Dominic Cummings, have been talking about... Big, big names. Exactly. The reasons that um, they took some of the decisions they did. Um, Lee Kane saying this was the wrong crisis for the Prime Minister's skill set. I think that's a polite way of um, saying what a lot of people are saying. Dominic Cummings... Um, Boris Johnson's top advisor at the, at the time, painting a picture of a very dysfunctional government that didn't really know what they were doing, Boris Johnson flip-flopping. Lots of colourful um, language. Lots of colourful language as well, which he's been criticised for and he has apologised for, but basically says he sticks to what he was saying at the time, which was he was just making clear what most people were thinking. Um, and a lot of kind of um, feeling that Boris Johnson would listen to the last person who'd left the room or the last thing that he'd heard. He's obviously known as being a people pleaser, yeah. so he really didn't want to lock down the country that's clear. Um, he was worried about the economy and obviously you know, wanted growth. He wanted to be a, a prime minister that was looked upon favorably by conservatives in terms of keeping freedoms and um, you know, making the economy better, which is what most conservatives want to do. Um, uh, Dominic Cummings saying it was pretty insane that Boris Johnson and other senior figures were on holiday in February 2020, which is when COVID was happening. There's a lot of talk about when Italy, was, it was rampant within Italy. Boris Johnson was sort of jovial about how Italy were dealing with the crisis, and he said it was going to be nothing more than swine flu. Um, at one point, uh, Dominic Cummings referring to him in WhatsApp um, messages saying he's back to Jaws mode. Now he's talking about Jaws, the movie, talking about the mayor keeping the beaches open despite some shark attacks, and then all hell breaks loose. And he's talking about um, Boris Johnson being back to Jaws mode, saying it's all going to be fine. You may remember um, that he was um, talking um, about shaking hands with people when he went to a hospital and then he himself caught it nearly died. Nearly died. So there's, there's, you know, Boris Johnson yet to appear. And we must say that Boris Johnson's spokesman says the Prime Minister is cooperating fully with the inquiry. So it'll be box office when Boris Johnson does appear in front of the inquiry that we don't know when that's going to be yet. Um, but generally, the evidence we're hearing is this kind of confident, macho approach from number 10, where they didn't really know what they were doing, but they weren't too concerned about it. Um, and then we know what happened. You know, hundreds of thousands of people died. So I think for um, some people, this will be sort of entertainment and gossip, watching this inquiry unfold. For others, obviously, people who lost people close to them, um, it will be incredibly um, painful and incredibly triggering, um, remembering those times when people were sort of in lockdown. Some people still have long COVID now. Um, so, uh, you know, it is a very important um, inquiry, I think, um, to look at the, you know, the mistakes that were made and how in future the government or whoever's in power can do things better because it's clear that I think the UK wasn't prepared. Um, I think a few years before this, there had been um, a pandemic sort of preparation plan in place, but the previous Conservative governments had not updated or had lost that. Um, 
So I think, um, yeah, you know, there's there's lots of gossip, there's lots of colourful language, there's lots of finger pointing, um, and obviously everyone's trying to, you know, um, keep their reputation intact and point the finger at someone else. Um, but like I said at the top of this, the purpose of the inquiry is to learn lessons. It's not to, um, you know, find people innocent or guilty. Um, I think what will come out of this will be, you know, lo a lot of media, a lot of um, newspaper articles talking about who is responsible for certain things. Um, and like I said, when Boris Johnson is up, because obviously he was the prime minister at the time, that will be incredibly interesting to see how he handles that, because a lot of this falls, you know, at his desk. It's all coming out in the wash. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Now to my final topic. King Charles III and Queen Camilla have just completed a four-day state visit to Kenya. Although the trip was billed as an opportunity to look to the future and build on the cordial modern-day ties between London and Nairobi, the legacy of decades of British colonial rule looms large. This includes the 1952 to 1960 emergency, where at least 10,000 people, mainly from the Kikuyu tribe, were killed. Although some historians and rights groups claim the true figure is much higher. The royal visit also comes as pressure mounts in some Caribbean Commonwealth countries to remove the British monarch as head of state. And as Republican voices here in the UK grow louder, well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Agnes Gittow. Agnes is the executive director at the Eastern African Association, responsible for the UK and EU. Agnes Gittel, it's always a pleasure having you on Channels Business Global. So, the king and his queen are in your country, Kenya. Talk to me about the significance of this visit. Thank you very much, Juliana. The choice of Kenya as uh, the first Commonwealth country for the king to visit during his coronation year is of great significance. It signifies our historic ties, some of them very painful, but also our modern partnership based on equal partnership. So it is a great honor for us as Kenyans to host the, his majesty, the king and, and the queen in, the, in, in Kenya. You're absolutely right. It's a major coup for Kenya. But let's be honest, you know, when it comes to African diplomatic relations, Kenya is way up there um, on top of the bill, of course, alongside Nigeria and um, Rwanda. Um, there was a lot of pressure around King Charles the Third in the lead up to his highly anticipated speech. Now, he did stop short of an apology, um, which I know even commentators in the UK were pushing for, um, but he did express his greatest sorrow for colonial atrocities. How is this being received? Is it enough? Juliana, our shared history is complex and long, dating back over six decades, right? When Kenya was under the British rule. Um, uh, incredible, inhumane Kenyans were put in concentration camps. This is the 1950s during the emergency. But it's as, as he quoted our late president saying that, our children may learn about our past, but our task as Kenyans, and I guess as British, is to be architects of the future. So despite the painful past, we acknowledge it, but we look forward to, to to future relationships that are based on honesty, openness, acknowledging that wrongs were committed. However, there is that honesty to say that, look, we understand and we hope that no, no other country or nation will have to suffer the same atrocities. And what's the mood um, and the body language been like from William Ruto? Um, we know that um, Prince William was in the Caribbean. A lot of the Caribbean leaders didn't matter who they were standing next to. They were pretty forthright in their views on being independent, on, you know, loosening their ties with the royal family. Did you get any sense of that? I didn't. But then, of course, I'm only seeing pictures. What are you hearing from your contacts on the ground? You know, currently, the, one of the biggest tasks for the Kenyan president is to ensure that Kenya's economy grows and, and citizens are able to have um, uh, good, uh, dignified lives, right? So focus is really on, on deeper economic yeah. relationships. It would be great to see His Majesty 
in Nigeria. Again, he has, of course, been there um, in the past. So I'm sure it's on uh, the list somewhere. Agnes Gitar, it's always an absolute pleasure speaking with you on Channels Business Global. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye. Bye.